How's it going? Uh, my name is Jagger. Just a show of hands, how many of you know about Crunchbase? I've heard of Crunchbase, raise your hand. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we track funded companies uh, in the world, and that means that we have a pretty good insight into who is getting the most funding. Uh, as you might tell from my slide, which you now see, uh, this is now a critical, important, interesting time in the world where for the first time ever, Asia has surpassed Silicon Valley in funding. This has never happened before. And, and it wasn't just a little bit, it was a lot. Uh, in fact, Asia and, and Asia and a lot of China almost doubled the amount of funding that went into Silicon Valley companies. Uh, we need to understand why. Why that happened and why does that matter to us? Does this mean that Silicon Valley is dead? The answer is no. You know, like this is, it, it was a bad year, uh, but it was still, compared to the rest of the world, doing pretty well. Uh, so there's still plenty of room in the Silicon Valley wagon, if you will. But what can we learn? How can we go and understand why this happened? And more importantly, what does this mean for our future, Asia's future, and how do we make money off of this? How do we go and profit from what we've learned? Uh, so with any good data presentation, I'm gonna show you a lot of slides, a lot of graphs. The disclaimer up front is that correlation does not lead to causation. The things I am showing you are only little parts of the things that add up to why things have happened the way they did. Uh, but I'm gonna focus on a specific area, which is what happened to the US getting into this investment game and why did that affect Asia at all? So, looking over time, we see that investors were going giving money to co uh, companies in America, right? And those companies say, great, I've got money now, I need to go and hire. So they start hiring and the demand for those IT jobs started to increase. Naturally, when demand increases, salaries start to increase. The average, uh, I mean, this, these are the average weekly salaries for in the US. If you just look at Silicon Valley, it's actually doubled or tripled these numbers. So it's very, very expensive to go and actually hire people, as some of you may know, in like the San Francisco Bay Area. So what does that mean? Well, the US starts saying, well, there, there's other options. We're just gonna start outsourcing. So over time, we started investing, or sending over millions and millions of jobs over to China, to India, to the Philippines, and that drove a huge economy for those locations. So how does, if you're a youth in Asia, how do you handle that? How do you respond to it? Well, you say, if I'm getting a degree, maybe I should go into STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Look at these numbers. This is actually a very telling slide. If the strength of a company is how good their employees are, I would argue the strength of a country is how well-educated is their workforce. And when you look at China, when you look at India, it would take the United States eight or more years to generate as many graduates in STEM as China did last year alone. That has a huge advantage. And when you get a lot of smart people, educated smart people together, they start companies. They start thinking about how do we go and build technology companies? How can we go and make money together? So surprise, surprise, you start seeing more and more funded companies, again, Crunchbase tracks funded companies, funded companies coming out of Asia. What does that mean? Well, if you get more companies coming out, tech companies coming out of Asia, you're going to start seeing more and more Unicorns. These are billion dollar companies, private companies, and yes, it's a lumpy thing, but you're starting to see an increase in the number of these unicorns. And what's more telling is if we go and overlay the United States on top of this to see how it compares to how many funded unicorns or founded unicorns came out year over year, you're going to see a very different story. You see that the U.S. is declining, whereas you see Asia is doing just fine. So if you're thinking about, hmm, where should I go and start my company? Where should I go and invest? You're gonna go and probably choose Asia. So that brings us to the next part of the story. Who is profiting? Spoiler alert, it's, in th it's the investors that are trying to figure out where do they go and spend their money. So when you think about who are the top Asian investors who are leading the way in Asia, you get companies like Chen Fen, uh, Shen Wei, there's, you know, these are people that have dramatically increased their portfolios in companies in Asia. Uh, these numbers, 47%, 40%, 
that's huge. These are massively increasing portfolios. These are going to become, if they're not already, the major investors of the planet. And that's a pretty exciting place to be if you are an investor for obvious reasons. But it's not just Asian investors. US investors slowly are starting to figure it out as well. So as you think about Sequoia as an example, investing over 300% more over the last five years into Chinese co companies. That's huge. This is, these are major trends. Now, I talked to a lot of U.S. investors, and some of them are not on the bandwagon yet. They're like, I don't want to go and go invest in a company. I can't sit in the board meeting physically. Um, I think that trend is changing. Uh, and the companies that move quickly, the, inv the investment firms, excuse me, that, that, that recognize that are going to change and benefit. <laughs> So how does that compare to uh, you know, the, the, who is investing in Asia? The US is actually doing a lot of the investment. In fact, almost double what China is doing as far as putting and investing into funding events in Asia. So if you're in a startup, in Asia, and you're thinking, well, I should only be talking to Asian investors. It just isn't true. You need to get engaged with these United States investors as well, because they are interested and they are spending a lot of money and sending a lot of money overseas. It's kind of interesting, you know, the U.S. used to go and put money into companies in the U.S. and they should send their money over and to, to outsource and then everyone would make the profit in the United States. Now the investors have figured out, let's just skip the middleman and let's just go and send the money overseas to the companies themselves are being funded. So you're seeing the sort of outsourcing of capital, which is a kind of interesting trend. So a lot of, again, we looked at just a thing, like lots of events drove the numbers we just looked at. A lot of things occurred that led to Asia surpassing Silicon Valley. We just looked at one sliver of them. But let's take those insights and go in and try to figure out what's next. And this is where, you know, 10 years from now, you'll either look back at this presentation and say, wow, that guy really knew his stuff, or you probably won't remember this presentation at all. Either way, um, what can we learn? You know, what can we figure out from this? Well, the cycle is repeating itself now in Asia. Wages now in Asia are increasing dramatically. In India alone, a 10% raise in 2016 across all salaries. That's an incredible change in the dynamics, the macroeconomics of, in that case, India. Um, compared to the average of the world, it's usually about 1% or 2%. These are huge, huge changes. What does that mean? Well, that means demand is increasing for the workforces in these countries. The other strange thing about it is that the, the workforces are also shrinking. Looking at China as an example, th th we've seen the largest decline in the size of the workforce since the 1950s. These are workforces that are getting older. These are workforces that, that, that aren't engaged with the workplace any longer. Um, it's not just a Chinese thing either. We're talking about a global phenomenon where the workforce is actually shrinking over time. If the IMF is right, we're actually going to see negative decline in size of workforce by 19, or sorry, 2050. That's incredible. Um, so are there areas of the world that are bucking this trend? Are there areas of the world where this isn't true? This is going to maybe surprise some of you. The answer is Africa. If you're looking over that same period using the same IMF data, Africa actually is doing amazingly well. If this is right, in 10 years, the number of new workers coming out of Africa will surpass the entire like, rest of the world. That's amazing, right? How do we take advantage of that? How do we go and benefit from it? Well, this youthful generation, 60% of Nigerians are under the age of 25. That is a workforce that's going to be around for a while. They're young. They're obviously having kids. It's going to keep growing. This is an important area to focus. Startup scene is starting to emerge. Surprise, surprise, jobs are coming. People are coming, looking for those jobs. They're good jobs. We are seeing an increase in the number of tech startups and the people working at those tech startups skyrocketing. When you think about Africa, it's 29 million new work people entering the workforce every single year. This is a crazy stat that I had to like triple check. 22% of the entire workforce, not just the youth, the entire workforce start a company. Yeah, they're not all high tech, but still this entrepreneurial mindset where you have to kind of make it on your own, do your own thing, I think has huge implications to Africa's future. 60% of the population is under the age of 25. And then just as a sort of side note, 
the embracing of technology is something that we just haven't seen before. In Kenya, 45% of the gross domestic pro uh, product is transacted in microtransactions through mobile. That's unbelievable. And that means like, if you're in that environment, you're going to be thinking about how can I make this more efficient? How can I optimize these things? How can I go and tap into this, this community culture? You're going to see innovation, and that's going to drive investment. So obviously, it's not just my thoughts here. A lot of big companies are putting a lot of money into Africa. Um, what's interesting is, even at Crunchbase, we're a pretty small company, uh, we outsource, and the, for the first time ever, we have in, outsourced one of our developers, and that was to Africa. So we used Andela, which is a great company, check it out, that helps, that is essentially educating the African workforce in high tech, and then to make it available for people to outsource to, and it's, it's working out ex extremely well. Facebook is investing in their IBM, SAP, big names, big investments. And it's not just companies, it's countries too. China itself has put in $100 billion into Africa, the infrastructure, having people go and, and become educated in high tech. Uh, I just read the other day that they opened their first military base, their first overseas military base in Africa. Um, this is not an accident. Like, this is a, a huge investment for Asia. And, you know, the, it's sort of tongue in cheek is Africa, China is China. It might be. Like, this is a place where there's very cheap labor hungry and interested in technology and trying to go and, and, and capitalize on that is something that we should all be thinking about how we do. So the question is, is, is that investment paying off for China? Short answer, yeah, it's really paying off. Over $170 billion of, of, of trade between China and Africa. Over $100 billion just last year alone. So that investment of $100 billion, short answer, Absolutely. So when you're thinking about, you know, as a startup, how do I go and leverage Africa? How do I go and outsource to it? Are there ways I can go and profit from the people in Africa? Obviously, there's a lot of people showing up now into high-tech industries. Is my, does my product apply? Can I build my product in a way that's interesting? If I'm an investor, I should be thinking about how do I go and capitalize off of Africa? Is, are there ways that I can go and fund that growth and be a part of that growth? Because if I could tell you in 2000, hey, there's this thing called Silicon Valley that's growing, like make some investments early, you're gonna make a gajillion dollars, that might have been really good advice, and you wish you did that. I'm saying that's happening again right now with Africa. So Asia is certainly on the front of this wave. We should take advantage of that. Uh, and I think it's going to continue for a long, long time. But always keep an eye on Africa. So the question I'm going to leave this sort of presentation uh, is... You know, do you agree with me? Do you think that Africa is going to be the world's next tech hotspot? And if so, what are you going to do to benefit? What are you going to go and do to capitalize on this huge new trend? Tweet me. I'm curious. At Jagger McConnell. That's my 15 minutes. Thank you for spending your, your non-refundable lifetime with me. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye.